morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our event um, relating to the Schrems decision. Um, for those of you who've joined us before, um, you'll know that during lockdown, we've done some panel discussions which have been quite informal in terms of looking at data protection issues. Um, today is going to be a little bit more formal with a little bit more presentation, um, and that's simply because um, there's quite a lot to get through and some aspects of it are quite complex. That's not to say that we're not going to be taking questions. We're more than happy if you submit questions during the presentation, and we're certainly hoping that we'll have time at the end to take um, Q&A then. So please use the um, Q&A rather than the chat box if you want to submit questions so that we can see the questions as we go through. Um, you'll see that in the Q&A box, there's also a link to a feedback survey. Um, if you could take the time to fill in the feedback survey, that would be um, fantastic. So moving on to the next slide, um, just to let you know who's going to be um, speaking today. Um, there'll be me. I'm a partner at Owen Mitchell and I specialise in data protection and also Lauren, who's an associate in the team, who also specialises in data protection. So moving on to the next slide. So certainly from a um, data point of view, um, last Thursday was a very big day for us, um, although to be honest, data protection always don't get out much, so uh, you know, make that what you will. Um, there was a decision of the Court of Justice of the EU that we've been waiting for for quite a long time relating to what's no, known as the Schrems 2 case. And essentially what that case relates to and what we're going to be talking about today is the compliant export of personal data outside the EEA. And certainly I think it's fair to say that the Schrems 2 case has put the cat amongst pigeons in relation to the export of personal data from the UK and the EU outside the EEA and um, primarily in relation to export to the US. So in a nutshell, um, what the court has done is it has invalidated the EU US Privacy Shield and it's also put additional requirements around standard contractual clauses, which are standard clauses which are approved by the Commission relating to the export of personal data. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at um, first what are the um, or were the mechanisms pre trends for exporting personal data outside the EEA, what the court has said, and most importantly, what the practical impact of that decision is going to be. Now, as you'll appreciate, it only happened last Thursday, and so there isn't definitive guidance from either the ICO or the European Data Protection Board at the moment as to what that might be. There have been holding statements. And so there might be some things that we're going to have to say we don't know or that we're waiting for guidance. And I think one of the um, takeaways I would say in relation to this is that um, what is being said by the um, data protection authorities um, is going to be important and it's important to monitor um, what they're saying because there is likely to be um, a flurry of guidance in the coming weeks. Hopefully it will be pretty soon because I think there's a lot of people that aren't quite sure what they're meant to be doing. Um, at the moment. The other thing that I would um, make the point on is that this trends decision is pretty important um, from a UK perspective for UK businesses because if we exit um, the uh, essentially following the transitional period, if we um, if Brexit happen, when Brexit happens on 31st December, if we don't have a deal, um, then we could be in the same position as the US. And so all of these discussions could be very relevant to the um, sending of personal data from Europe to the UK. But we're going to have a look at um, the Brexit implications later. But I thought it's just worth flagging that um, that it is particularly important from a UK um, perspective. So in terms of a quick refresher on where we were um, pre trends um, as you'll see from the slide, um, you could export personal data from the EU to all countries within the EEA, so the EU and a few other countries, um, without any controls. It was regarded as fine because everybody is meant to, were meant to be applying the same controls and protections in relation to personal data. The problem 
um, arises where you're talking about countries outside um, the EEA. And if you want to send personal data to countries outside the EEA, then in order to be able to do it in a compliant way, you've got to jump through um, certain hoops. And I think there are three main ways to do it. Um, either the country concerned or the organisation concerned an international organisation can have what's called a finding of adequacy. Um, or there can be um, safeguards or, and these are regarded as a, a secondary measures, there can be derogations um, which are like individual exemptions, which we'll have a look at um, later. So having a look first, moving on to the next slide at um, what's meant by adequacy. Essentially, um, certain countries have been considered by the EU to see whether or not they provide um, a suitable level of adequacy in terms of the protections that's given to personal data, the ability of individuals to get redress in the courts or to bring proceedings, and um, also the ability for national security bodies to access their personal data. And so all that assessment is done um, by the Commission and the parameters of that assessment are essentially set out in Article 45 of GDPR. Now, in terms of um, adequacy, um, you can have a full finding of adequacy so that all transfers to that particular country are OK, or you can have a partial finding. So you'll see on the slide that there is a list of countries where there is a finding of adequacy. And you'll see that there's a note next to Canada um, and Canada's got a partial finding of adequacy, so it relates to um, commercial data rather than um, public body data um, in relation to Canada. And at the bottom, you'll see that I've referenced the US Privacy Shield. Um, sometimes people don't realise that the Privacy Shield isn't a whole separate sort of set of um, legitimising ways of exporting personal data to the US. It is a version of adequacy and so it was a limited version of adequacy. And what Privacy Shield um, was is essentially businesses and organisations in the US could self-certify under Privacy Shield that they would undertake to meet the requirements set out in Privacy Shield and there would be an ombudsperson in the US in relation to um, issues that might arise if you were unhappy about how your personal data had been used in the US. So there was this, um, this sort of version of adequacy, but only in relation to companies and organisations in the US that had self-certified. Um, so we're going to have a look at it. And as I say, unfortunately, um, depending on your perspective, either unfortunately or fortunately, depending on whether you are relying on it or whether you are a privacy purist, um, the Privacy Shield has now gone, which we will have a look at. That's what that impact will be later. Moving on to the next slide. Um, another alternative, as I said, is that if the country you're wanting to send the personal data to didn't have a finding of adequacy, you could put in place um, certain specified safeguards which were set out in Article 46. Now I've just put a flavour of what those safeguards are on the slide because these are the most relevant to commercial organisations and certainly um, the most popular one that people used were the uh, and are the standard contractual clauses and I think according to an IAPP survey 88% um, of all data export outside the EEA is done on the basis of standard contractual clauses. Um, I'll also potentially call them SEC um, during the presentation as Mike Lawrence. So if we refer to um, SCC as an acronym, we are talking about standard contractual clauses, which is again another name for model clauses in terms of that was also quite a popular name pre um, GDPR. And so what the um, model clauses are, are a set of clauses, contractual clauses that essentially the exporter and importer enters into and the content of it has been approved by the European Commission. Um, and certainly it, it contains quite detailed um, provisions and obligations on both the exporter and importer of the personal data. Although to my knowledge, a lot of people, um, I know some people that didn't even read them before they signed them and use them as a, a sort of an export um, model. 
So that's um, another option if you're wanting to um, transfer personal data outside the EEA. And another, something else which is um, quite useful if you can get it um, is authorization under binding corporate rules. That's where you have got um, corporate rules between group companies. So it's only useful for um, group company transfers. Um, and essentially you agree the rules that will apply throughout the group um, for how personal data will be handled. Um, they're quite difficult to get and it's a very long winded process. So then there's not a lot of group companies um, that have binding corporate rules, but it might be something that when we talk about the impact of the Schrems decision, they might become more popular and it might be that, I don't know, that the, the um, regulators, the data protection authorities have a look to see whether or not the um, process for getting binding corporate rules approved might be made slightly easier. I've mentioned two on the slide, which you might think is a little bit odd because I've put not yet in place. Um, the reason why I've mentioned the possibility of um, there being an approved certification scheme or a code of conduct is that they are two things which have been referenced as being possible solutions to what's happened under Schrems in terms of maybe that um, the EU will therefore rush through um, certification schemes or codes of conduct to try and improve um, what's been happening. So I have just flagged them there. They're not currently in use, but they are something um, which is a possibility. And finally, um, moving on to the next slide before I hand over to Lauren, is um, looking at the possibility of if you can't use, if you've not got finding adequacy, or you can't use one of the safeguards in Article 46 of GDPR, um, there are what are called derogations under Article 49. And they're sort of like individual exemptions and the recitals in GDPR certainly say that you shouldn't really um, be using them for um, long term um, ongoing um, transfers of personal data. Their, their intention is more um, on a sort of ad hoc um, basis, but nonetheless they are there and they may well fall in, under the spotlight following um, the Schrems 2 decision. And you'll see the sorts of things that are there. So, for example, you can get the explicit consent of the um, individual concerned, or if, for example, it's necessary um, that somebody wants a contract performing in America, for example, um, it may well be that their personal data has to be transferred to the US in order for that contract to be performed. Um, again, um, I've just put an idea of what those are up there. There are others that can be considered um, in relation to things like um, public sector bodies, but I thought it'd be useful to give a flavour um, in the context of um, business organisations. So what I'm going to do now before we have a look at the practical impact and what you might want to be thinking about doing as a result of the Schrems 2 decision, is I'm going to hand over to Lauren, who's going to have a look at ex well, what, did, what did the court say? Um, in both Shrems 1 and Shrems 2. So I'm going to hand over to Lauren now. Thanks, Joanne. Um, and um, I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much detail because obviously I, I think for, for most people watching, um, the, the main points they want to get to is what, what the impact is upon them. Um, so um, just as a brief background, um, this all began in um, 2013 when um, the privacy activist uh, Max Schrems um, submitted a complaint to the Irish DPC on the basis that in relation to Facebook, because his personal data was being transferred to, to the States and stored in the States, he didn't believe that um, his privacy rights were being protected. Um, so that eventually kind of went to the High Court in, in Ireland, which referred it to the Court of um, Justice of the European Union, and um, who in 2015, um, because of, of what had happened uh, and what was in place at the point, um, said that safe harbour was invalid. This then went back to um, the High Court in Ireland and, and the DPC, and the DPC asked uh, Max if he wanted to, to review his complaint, which then brought about the kind of next step that we're in now. Um, um, if you can just go on to the next slide, um, which kind of brought in um, Trends too. So obviously, Privacy Shield was entered into in, in 2016 as, as a kind of a replacement of um, the safe harbour regime, which had been declared invalid. In relation to kind of where we got to in the court case, um, DPC 
had issues then on, in terms of standard contractual clauses after kind of Matt Trent had, had clarified his position and his complaint uh, on the basis that Facebook was um, transferring to the states under SCCs. Um, this then went back to the High Court uh, for, for the question of whether um, his the SCCs were valid. Um, at that point, obviously, this, this dated back to a complaint in 2013, which what at the point Privacy Shield wasn't in place. Um, and my understanding is I watched uh, um, a um, video with Matt Trent last week commenting on it, and, and the actual Privacy Shield was introduced to this uh, at the very last minute uh, in the High Court case, uh, with the barrister for Facebook essentially saying that SCCs are valid because Privacy Shield is valid, and obviously in terms of those surveillance questions, um, they were fine with Privacy Shield, which obviously meant that SCCs was, was valid. That then brought SC, uh, Privacy Shield into the, the case, um, and the High Court essentially referred um, 11 questions to the Court of Justice of the European Union, um, two of which referred to the point about Privacy Shield. Um, in terms of its, um, whether it's valid um, in looking at those surveillance issues and also the question of um, the ombudsman. So the idea around privacy shield would there be a, an independent ombudsman who would look at and kind of adjudicate um, if, if there's any questions in terms of surveillance. Um, so if we can just move on to the next slide. As I am sure you have probably all seen in the news over the past week um, and all those kind, kind of headlines, um, this then led us to, to where we are now, where the um, court determined um, that Privacy Shield is invalid. Uh, and, and they are essentially the only kind of place that can, that can determine an, an invalid, uh, it being invalid. So that's why the High Court had to refer it to the Court of Justice for European Union. Um, the reasons behind it, so when Privacy Shield was set up, there, there was an element of, of understanding that there would be some surveillance, but it would be limited. And then obviously where we've got to now is the kind of point that were referred from the Irish High Point at uh, High Court is actually to what extent is that surveillance limited, um, which um, the court found it wasn't. Um, and then the kind of protections and the rights of the individuals if they're um, personal data had been um, surveilled. Um, the question in terms of the ombudsperson also was they were not sufficient because in terms of where you are in the charter, they wouldn't necessarily, their, their opinion uh, isn't considered the opinion of a tribunal. Um, so that also fell as well. Um, so then we move on to the question in terms of SCCs. Um, if we can just move on to the next slide. So in terms of SCCs, um, these were found to be valid still, but um, subject to um, certain conditions, um, which on the next slide, there's a few. Uh, um, so as John's already mentioned, uh, and, and we'll go into further in, in terms of uh, the impact after this is, some of the contractual clauses are, um, but there's there's been quite a lot of kind of seen as it's a mechanism, and if you sign up to this, then that's all you have to do, just get both parties to sign. There's um, annexes to it where you set out specifics in, in, in terms of the relationship, and there's also importers and um, security technical um, abilities. And there has kind of been a, a practice, like practically, where people essentially sign up to it and then, then put it in the drawer and forget about it. Um, there are a lot of contractual obligations, which essentially the courts have now come out and said, you need to fulfill those contractual obligations. So, so what the court said is not necessarily anything new. It's saying that what's in there needs to be done. That being said, um, the kind of intention originally was that obviously standard contractual clauses are kind of a standard level of a level, um, but now the judgment essentially says that it needs to be considered in terms of Article 45, which are the kind of adequacy level. Um, so that's that's one thing to, to be brought into question. There's also in terms of um, saying that the, the data protection authority, so here in the UK, would be the ICO. 
um, need to look at and monitor the compliance with the standard of contractual clauses. And, it, and if they deem that in a particular transfer setting, it's not sufficient, then they should act on that and, and suspend that transfer. So it would be more on a case by case circumstance. Obviously, that's going to be put more a burden on the regulator and also it could lead to the difference in that not the consistent approach which GDPR kind of um, foresaw um, obviously not necessarily being taken forward if DPAs are taking different views in relation to this. So that's kind of a quick shot in kind of a, what happened in the ruling and where we are with the judgment and um, so I'll move now back to Joanne to discuss uh, what this actually means and the impact of these judgments. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, looking at the next slide. So, as I said, Privacy Shield um, was a very popular way of legitimising the sending of personal data to the US. Um, I think um, last count there were more than 5,000 um, US organisations who self-certified under um, Privacy Shield and there were thousands of EU um, businesses who were using Privacy Shield on the back of that um, self-certification. So it was very widely used. So the fact that Privacy Shield is invalid does give rise to a problem to a large number of businesses. And certainly I think um, there is an element of frustration in the US that um, Privacy Shield has been invalidated by the um, Court of Justice. Um, I think one of the things that um, has been discussed about it is did it really need to be invalidated in relation to all um, transfers of personal data? So, for example, if the concern was in relation to the security um, organisations being able to access personal data, could you not have just invalidated it in relation to, say, communications data rather than everything? So, you know, if there's a, a, an app store game that's in the US and essentially all they're collecting is metadata relating to your playing of a word search game, um, is it likely that the CIA or NSA are interested in that? I suspect probably not. Um, so there has been some frustration in the US that it has been completely invalidated rather than, and I guess, sort of, you know, been completely um, got rid of rather than a sort of more um, nuanced view taken of what could happen to it. And the Secretary of State um, for commerce in the US um, has said he's, he's quite unhappy about it. So what, do, what but what, do, what does it mean? Technically, as of last Thursday, um, Privacy Shield went. If you were exporting personal data on the basis of Privacy Shield to the US, then it, you should have stopped it. Um, as of last Thursday, whilst you found a new way of doing it or you should have put an alternative um, way of exporting the personal data in place. Having said that, from a practical point of view, the ICO um, has said on its um, export of personal data pages, not to panic and to wait and see. So that if you already have it in place, um, the ICO has said, wait and see what we say in our guidance. And I suspect they've taken that pragmatic approach because as Lauren said, we've been here before because there was a precursor to Privacy Shield called Safe Harbour that was invalidated. There was an awful lot of panic. And I think the ICO have taken a pragmatic approach to say we're going to consider our position. And what we're going to do is think about um, what we're going to say to people. So from a UK perspective, um, the ICO has said just leave things in place at the moment. Um, certainly, um, I don't think that's been a consistent approach with all data protection authorities. And so if you have um, group operations in other countries, um, that may well um, not apply and it may well lead to a fragmented approach across um, the EU. Um, the European Data Protection Board hasn't said the same at the moment. Um, they've issued a holding statement. Um, they have they were, however, I understand, um, scheduled to meet yesterday and today um, to agree what their position is going to be um, on this and on various other things arising from um, Shrems 2. So fingers crossed, we'll get some guidance from them fairly quickly. And um, some people are saying that it should be out by the end of the week. Um, 
don't know, that, that would be great if it is out by the end of the week. But again, as I said at the outset, um, I think watch this space is going to be the watchword of this in terms of making sure that you are looking to see what the ICO and European Data Protection Board are saying. Um, and certainly we are going to um, continue to comment on the sort of things that are being said about this. In terms of what you should do um, immediately at a practical level is I think you need to understand um, if you have been relying on Privacy Shield. It may well be as part of your GDPR compliance that you know exactly which arrangements are subject to Privacy Shield where you've used it. If you don't, then I think the first thing you need to do is understand whether you have got any export arrangements which rely on Privacy Shield and note those so that you understand the scope of your problem as a result of Privacy Shield being invalidated. Um, the other thing that I will just say as well is that there was some confusion um, happening after this decision as to whether or not the invalidation of Privacy Shield um, only applied to the US or whether it also invalidated export to other jurisdictions. As I said at the outset, Privacy Shield only validates export to the US, so it's not going to change the position um, if you're exporting to India or any other jurisdiction um, that's not the US. So moving on to the next slide, looking at the longer term impact of the um, invalidity of um, Privacy Shield. Um, the first point is that the ICO has also made the pragmatic point, um, which is don't enter into any new arrangements using Privacy Shield. So if you've got any pending contracts and you were going to use Privacy Shield, um, don't just press ahead with them because whilst the ICO has said you can leave in place current arrangements, what you certainly can't do is put in place any new arrangements um, relating to Privacy Shield. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is um, both the um, EU Commission and um, US counterparts are keen um, to try and sort out something on Privacy Shield. They want to come up with something um, workable because there is an understanding um, that the value of data export, I think it's somewhere in the region of around $7.1 trillion in terms of the um, export personal data between the US and the um, EU. Um, and certainly the statement that's been issued um, by the Commission is that um, they are working together um, they don't feel that they have to start from scratch. What they feel they have to do is um, essentially change what's already there um, to meet the requirements of the court and they feel that the court has given them some helpful guidance. I'm not sure what that helpful guidance is, but um, they do feel that they can reach um, a decision moving forward on Privacy Shield, which they feel um, will um, solve the issue. Um, although on the basis that one of the big issues um, from Shrums 2 is the ability of the US government in terms of security services um, to access personal data, it will be interesting to see what the solution is they come up with that, because from a policy point of view, I suspect that level of um, potential surveillance is, is unlikely to be reduced. Um, so, you know, hopefully they will come up with something workable. Um, if not, I suspect we might be uh, meeting again to talk about Shrooms 3 in the future. So in terms of what it means from um, your point of view um, is that essentially once you've worked out any personal data that you were transferring um, personal data to the US on Privacy Shield is that you need to have a look at an, any alternatives that might work for you. And certainly when Safe Harbour um, was invalidated, the thing that most people jumped on was to put in place standard contractual clauses as an alternative. Now that's an interesting one um, and there has been some interesting comment from um, the DPC in Ireland in relation to that. And I sort of agree from a logical point of view with the point and, and what, what's been said by the DPC is that if the legal arrangements in the US which allow for surveillance um, and that there's no real independence of the ombudsperson and there's no proper redress um, mean that Privacy Shield isn't valid, if what you've got to do with model clauses and standard contractual clauses is have a look at the surrounding legal um, position in the country in conjunction with the clauses to make sure that people are getting adequate protection 
which is equivalent to um, section 45, then um, does that mean that that's actually going to work if you try and put um, standard contractual clauses in place for the US? Because you've still got the same problems with surveillance, you've still got the same problems um, in relation to not having adequate redress. So there is a potential for um, logically um, standard contractual clauses not to be an alternative with the US because when you do the evaluation, um, the um, US arrangements could cause a problem and you wouldn't come up with the answer potentially that people are getting the appropriate protection of their personal data. So that is something um, just to think about. And as I say, we've not had any um, concrete guidance on that and it would be useful um, to get that. Um, the other one are, is obviously binding corporate rules um, in relation to um, intra-group transfers, so um, within group companies. Um, they um, are available, but as I say, they're not going to be quick. So as a quick alternative, um, SCCs can be done very quickly. Um, binding corporate rules can't be done quickly, but you might want to think about um, starting the journey on binding corporate rules um, in terms of sorting that out for the future. Um, obviously, you've got your Article 49 derogations and one of the questions we've been asked is in relation to the transfer of personal data um, outside the EA on the basis of the derogations, where you've got a contract, does the contract have to be with the individual? And there are two different um, derogations. The one I've mentioned, the um, contract does have to be within the individual. There is a different derogation relating to um, whether the contract is a third party and impacts on the individual, but the, the technical differences between the two, and I'm not going to go into them in detail, but um, for whoever's asked that question, it is worth having a look at Article 49 um, in relation to that. Um, the other things which are slightly more um, technical or pragmatic, which potentially need to be thought about, um, is if the, you know, you can't put um, binding corporate rules in place and you're concerned about um, standard contractual clauses, is, is looking at the personal data itself. Um, does it need to be um, transferred as personal data? Could it be anonymised? If you're going to be using it for statistical analysis and in actual fact you don't need personal data, you only need anonymised data, um, it might be worth thinking about that because obviously if it's properly um, anonymised and anonymised from a GDPR point of view, um, then it stops being um, personal data. Um, one of the other things that could be thought about is looking at the arrangements in terms of where your personal data goes. Um, is it possible to keep it within the EEA? Because if you keep it within the EEA, you don't have these issues. Um, but again, I appreciate that that might not be possible, um, certainly in all um, situations. Um, as I say, these are ideas at the moment and the issues relating to standard contractual clauses obviously are, um, you know, potentially there. So I think watch this space, as I said, is quite important in terms of having a look at what the European Data Protection Board, the ICO and various other um, data protection um, regulators are saying is um, actually quite important. The final point I would make on this before we move on to sort of standard contractual clauses and the practical points arising from that is that it's unlikely that one size will fit all. Is it, it might well be the case that standard contractual clauses will help in relation to certain data transfers. It might be the case that um, some of the Article 49 derogations will help you in relation um, to some of the others, but I think it's a question of thinking about um, which one would be the most relevant. You know, so by way of example, if you were planning on um, trying to use the Article 49 um, derogations in relation to employee data and you wanted to use consent, that probably wouldn't be the best bet because you're not meant to be using consent in an employment situation. So that's what I mean by um, one size. Um, doesn't fit on to do an evaluation. It's probably um, just as a to, to final point, Joanne, um, in, in relation to those derogations are that the intention of them were only for kind of 
one-off or specific transfers as well. It, it, they, they weren't kind of put there to be kind of con for, to replace or be allowed for continuous transfers. Um, so um, just as kind of a, an additional point in relation to that. No, that, that, that's absolutely right. Um, I think when the courts have referenced Article 49, it's not a solution, it's not a long term solution and shouldn't be seen as a long term solution. Um, moving on to the next slide um, in terms of the impact of the Schrems decision in relation to um, standard contractual clauses. As I think I um, mentioned, um, essentially standard contractual clauses are very widely used and around 88% of um, export of personal data was done on the back of standard contractual clauses. Um, and it certainly did used to be the case, as I think both Lauren and I have said, that they were printed off, topped and tailed, put in a drawer, and nobody ever looked at them again. That's certainly um, gone. You now have to look, as Lauren said, to see whether or not you can use standard contractual clauses by looking at the package, looking at the contractual obligations in the clauses, and also having a look at the surrounding legal um, system in the country that you're exporting to. And when you're sort of looking at the um, the position, the legal system in the country that you are exporting to, you have to do an evaluation based on Article 45.2. And the reason I've referenced Article 45.2 is because that's the um, article that is used by the Commission to do an adequacy um, assessment in relation to particular countries. And so it has a long list of things which have to be considered, which look at, say, the data protection laws, looks at the ability for um, national security bodies to be able to engage in surveillance, looks at the ability of redress to individuals and things like that. There's a big long list of things. And the point I would make is that um, when the Commission is using those criteria to do an evaluation of a country from an ad adequacy point of view, it usually takes around three years and it's an in-depth assessment. So turning around and sort of saying to businesses that they need to do their own assessment under 45.2, um, it, it strikes me that without guidance, that's going to be really, really difficult, particularly if you're trying to do it very, very quickly um, to put something um, in place. Maybe, you know, if you've got a problem under Privacy Shield and you need to put um, standard contractual clauses in place very quickly. Um, I think it, it, it raises from a practical point of view, if you are planning on using standard contractual clauses, what, what, what are you going to have to do? Um, certainly from um, a due diligence point of view in terms of if you are planning, let's say you are wanting to use the standard contractual clauses because you're engaging a service provider um, offshore outside the UEA um, and they're going to be getting access to your um, customer and personal data, for example. What do you need to do from a due diligence point of view and who should do it? The European um, Data Protection Board has um, indicated that the obligation to have a look at the package of standard contractual clauses um, in conjunction with the legal system is an obligation on both importer and exporter. It's not a question um, of just one of you has the obligation, it is both. But if, it's, if you are exporting to a jurisdiction you are not familiar with, what you're either going to have to do is get the importer to give you the information that you're talking about, or you're going to have to take legal advice in the jurisdiction um, in terms of taking your own advice. And if you rely on what the importer told you, you're going to have to be very confident um, that they are giving you correct advice in relation to this. Um, it also obviously raises the um, point in terms of if you've got to do this assessment as to who's going to pay. Um, because it will involve cost, um, particularly if, for example, you're going to have to take wide ranging legal advice in a jurisdiction you're not at all familiar with, and whether or not from a contractual point of view, you agree um, what the payment um, obligations, the cost obligations and implications of that um, are going to be. Um, you'll see that one of the points I've flagged on the slide is the point I've raised already in terms of there are already arguments that um, standard contractual clauses actually, if you have to look at them in the round with the legal system can't be used in certain jurisdictions at all. Um, the DPC has mentioned the US from a logical point of view if Privacy Shield has been invalidated, but are there other jurisdictions 
where there might be extensive state surveillance, um, which means that standard contractual clauses aren't available. Will, for example, the ICO or the European Data Protection Board issue a list of countries where they've got severe concerns as to whether or not standard contractual clauses will work? I don't know. Again, I think it's a question of um, waiting to see um, what's said, but it is something um, that does need to be thought about. The other thing um, that I would say in relation to standard contractual clauses is for those of you who have been looking at them um, as part of your GDPR compliance program is that the standard contractual clauses that we currently have <coughs> sorry, are those which um, predate GDPR. They've not yet been updated for GDPR. Um, we are told that um, they have been reviewed and I understand um, that the, the work had pretty much um, been done. But essentially um, they were holding back on issuing the new standard contractual clauses, waiting to see what Shrem said, to see whether or not any adjustments needed to be made um, to the SCCs. So hopefully if they are just about done and need to be tweaked in light of um, the Shrem's 2 decision, then they'll be out soon. Um, from a UK perspective, I think it does raise an interesting point in terms of does that mean you therefore have to migrate onto the new standard contractual clauses? I think certainly in light of this decision, I would advise that you should. Um, there was a thought at one point, and certainly um, I think it was pre-GDPR or just after GDPR, the ICO had indicated that they thought the standard contractual clauses, um, the new ones, would be very similar to the old ones. So their approach might be to let people um, keep in place the old um, standard contractual clauses. I suspect if um, they have been updated and have got to be updated to pick up the changes arising from this decision, um, that the ICO will now expect the updated standard contractual clauses to be used. But again, um, that's sort of my personal opinion in terms of there's nothing issued from the ICO um, at the moment following this to say what their position is going to be on it. But I do think it's something that's worth thinking about. So another practical impact of this will be is when the new standard contractual clauses come out, you will need to potentially think about um, factoring in um, putting those in place. Um, I've certainly heard people say, well, it's just a papering exercise. Um, I think that's uh, not going to be the case on the basis. Obviously, it's a sort of reassessment and entering into new contracts and certainly um, following um, Shrems 2, I don't think you can call the standard contractual clauses a papering exercise um, anymore. So that is something that I will just flag in terms of the new standard contractual um, clauses. So moving on to the next slide, I thought it would be useful to also put the Schrems decision um, in the context of Brexit. Um, and as I flagged at the beginning of um, the discussion, there is, um, it is a particular issue um, for UK, for the UK, UK business. After, um, 31st December 2020 in the transitional agreement, um, we will, the UK will be very much a third country, as they call it from an EU perspective, from a privacy perspective. And so we will be in the same position um, as the US or any other country outside the EEM. So if you have arrangements where, for example, you have a customer in the EU and they want to um, essentially um, send their data to you for you to be able to provide services in relation to it, um, then you need to think about how they're going to be able to send that data um, to you. So moving on to the next slide. If um, there is a deal, then the export of the personal data um, to the UK is likely to be picked up. So that if your customer, if you do have a customer and they're based say in France and they need to send um, their personal data to you, then it will be caught by the deal. If there is no deal, however, and we end up with a no deal Brexit, um, then it does mean that hoops will need to be jumped through in order to um, export the data to the UK. 
And in terms of the likelihood of a deal by December, in terms of, I don't know, recently, I think in the press um, over the last couple of days, it's been saying that it's looking less likely. Um, if there is no deal, what the UK has said is that they will be looking for um, an adequacy decision. So essentially what the argument is, is that they will want the EU to recognise that because essentially we're going to preserve GDPR after Brexit and that we have the same level of protection as we did before Brexit of personal data and therefore um, we should be given an adequacy um, decision. And if there's an adequacy decision, as I mentioned at the outset, will be on that list of countries and personal data can be exported to us um, without there being jumping through additional hoops. Um, the difficulty with adequacy is that obviously it's not a quick process. I think I mentioned to you that it sometimes takes around three years for an adequacy decision to be made. Um, the hope is that because we've implemented GDPR, um, that it will be a much quicker decision, but I think there's probably um, political issues around that and whether or not there's political will to expedite it, I, I don't know. Um, if you ask me to place a bet on it, I would say we will not get adequacy um, by the end of the year, but I may be wrong. Um, certainly the ICO's position is that they are monitoring the position in relation to Brexit negotiations and adequacy negotiations. And so um, certainly um, it is again, watch this space in relation to that. And um, if we don't get adequacy, where does that leave us? Um, well, it means that probably people will have to look at putting in place um, standard contractual clauses to send personal data from the EU um, to the UK. Um, that then means that if say back to this um, customer in France who wants to send their personal data to you, they will have to look at the standard contractual clauses in conjunction with the um, system within the UK. So they will have to look at um, the data protection protections, which, you know, on the basis we have GDPR in place in the Data Protection Act 2018, that seems to be a nice tick in a box. I think the difficulty is, and, and certainly commentators have raised this, is that obviously we have a surveillance regime also. And the question mark is whether or not the criticisms that were levelled at the US in terms of not meaning that um, individuals got adequate protection as a result of the potential surveillance by national security organisations um, could cause a problem in terms of using standard contractual clauses for the UK. Again, um, I don't have the answer on this in terms of where we're going to be with this. Um, and again, I think it is a case of um, watch this space. But certainly I think I can say that there was an assumption um, that if there was a no deal Brexit and we didn't have adequacy, that there would be, as I say, this thing called a papering exercise and people would put in place standard contractual clauses to bring personal data um, from the EU into the UK. Um, as I've just said um, a few minutes ago, putting in place standard contractual clauses now is most definitely not just a papering exercise. It does involve quite detailed evaluation. Um, so that will make life quite difficult. What I would say from a practical point of view is to understand um, where things stand and make preparations. Um, if you have got important customers um, in France, be having discussions when it once it becomes quite clear what's likely to happen um, from a Brexit point of view and whether or not we will um, get a deal and, and plan for how you're going to be doing it. Um, one of the things that has also been suggested is that if, um, for example, you are the data importer and you are providing services to customers in the EU, um, you might want to put a pack together, a due diligence pack together for them to explain um, what the position is in relation to the laws um, in the UK to try and make it um, easier. Obviously, you do need to be careful that you're not soon giving legal advice to them, but that has been suggested as being a way of securing uh, business in relation to that. Um, so unfortunately, um, as you'll see, um, the position isn't straightforward um, from a Brexit point of view. And certainly um, the sooner we get guidance from either the ICO or the European Data Protection Board, um, the better. Um, the one um, sort of ray of light that, that you could argue in relation to Brexit is that it might be possible um, for there to be a UK-US privacy shield. 
um, the Swiss have got their own um, and obviously um, the EU, EU one has been invalidated, but it might be possible once we're, um, you, you know, post Brexit, post the end of the year, um, for there to be a, U, a UK US um, privacy shield. So that might make life easier um, for UK businesses that don't have good companies um, in the EU. But as I say, um, I think the Schrems 2 decision has sort of set the pattern of the pigeons from a data export point of view, and I think it is something that um, unfortunately uh, will evolve over the next few weeks. I think it's a question of um, waiting and seeing. Um, I think we have um, got to a Q&A. Um, we've got time for some um, questions in terms of looking at the time. So um, Lauren, do you want to do some of the uh, questions? Yeah, so, so one of the ones that has come in is in relation to obviously the, the discussion has been about um, the surveillance issues in the US and, and as you've mentioned there after Brexit, after the transition period ended that obviously the UK will be subject to those kind, same kind of considerations. Um, so someone's asked uh, whether you need to, to consider the um, surveillance issues with countries within the EEA. Um, so obviously at the moment, one of the reasons why, why the UK hasn't has had this issue up to, to this point is actually that those considerations, whilst the, the court um, has the ability to assess outside the EEA, um, those kind of all of these considerations are for that transfer when it goes outside the EEA and, and are not kind of, it, it's two problems. So it's actually a consideration when it's outside the EEA, but it doesn't need to be considered when it's within the EEA. Um, so I don't know if you have anything further to add on that, that Joanne, in terms of actually questioning member state surveillance laws from, from a GDPR perspective, it's not there. And, and to my mind, it's not within the, the court's jurisdiction to, to um, review that for member yeah, states. I, mean, I don't think, um, I mean, Shrems didn't consider it. Um, in terms of where will we, other member states, um, they can send around to the other member states without um, considering those. And so they're not in the mix, certainly for e EEA to EEA transfers. Um, when um, sort of next beginning of next year, um, there has been a question mark over from a UK perspective, can we continue to send personal data um, to EU and EEA countries? And certainly the UK position at the moment um, although it might change obviously post trends, is that you can continue to send personal data um, to the other EU countries um, and there's not been a discussion about um, their surveillance laws so far as part of that. Whether or not that will arise um, after this decision, I don't know. Um, and whether or not if we don't get adequacy, whether that might be something that's raised in terms of by way of some sort of political leverage. Again, I don't know, but certainly the original statement and the position of the ICO on their website at the moment is post Brexit, you can send um, personal data from the UK to EEA countries and you don't have to do evaluations. And to some extent, some of these questions are, are probably political rather than legal questions because ultimately the same the same as the UK and the US, obviously questions people are saying, is this going to prompt a change in law in the US and everything? And, and obviously that's, that's more of a political issue. Um, so it is a kind of watch this space. Um, and I know other people have kind of raised the issue is now that Privacy Shield has been made invalid and um, there are those other adequacy um, decisions for different countries that may have, since they were declared adequate, uh, have changed their surveillance laws and, and whether they're going to be challenged. Again, I, I haven't heard of anything um, of any particular countries whether they're going to be questioned, but also we don't know what, what's on the, the kind of agenda for the um, privacy activist, activists. Um, so um, unless you're aware of anything, Joanne, then I think at the moment it's kind of it just just relates to Privacy Shield and um, we don't know how it's going to progress from now uh, in relation to, to other countries. Yeah, no, I, th I think, um, as you say, there are a lot of policy issues and political issues tied up with this and it will be interesting and obviously we can't really comment on those. It'll be interesting to see how those pan out from a US perspective, from a UK perspective. Um, uh, to be honest, it's a bit of a can of worms at the moment um, in terms of trying to tie everything 
policy and law together on that. Uh, and then another question that we've had, which I know has, there has been quite a lot of commentary on it in the, in the past week, is um, whether you could get around kind of the, the issues in relation to surveillance and, and put in place uh, the FCCs if, if you do a risk assessment and assess that the area that you're in and the type of kind of work that you do isn't essentially subject to those um, surveillance requirements or you haven't previously um, being subject to the surveillance requirements or, or they've not kind of investigated you. So um, that that's a question that's been raised and also something that I know quite a lot of people have commented on. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts in relation to that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point. And uh, there's a lot of people coming up with um, potential ways of improving the situation in terms of, so if you're doing the evaluation for standard contractual clauses, what's the position if you, um, you use encryption or you use other methods of keeping the information um, secure. Um, what, could you argue that if you are merely transferring data in um, an area that um, the security services are not going to be interested in, can you say that you can ignore the surveillance laws in that country? Um, I think the first point I would say in relation to that is that there is no guidance on that and on either point and I think they're valid points that need um, consideration in terms of whether or not there are potentially technical solutions to improve the situation and mean that when you do your evaluation in the round of your standard contractual clauses whether you can apply technical solutions to that. Um, what I would say in relation to the point you've made about particular areas in terms of sectors is that, as I said, there was some disappointment in the states that the invalidity of Privacy Shield wasn't restricted to communications data. Um, what happened in the court case um, when they thought about Privacy Shield was that um, they looked at the what the, the law said. So if the law gave a potential for um, surveillance, then that was the thing that was taken into consideration, not whether surveillance would happen from a practical point of view. So in terms of dividing up particular sectors to say, well, our sector is not something that um, the security um, organisations are going to be interested in, therefore we can use standard contractual clauses. That's not the evaluation that was done under Privacy Shield. So if you make, if you sort of extrapolate what was said under Privacy Shield to standard contractual clauses, you being in a sector that the NSA is not interested in is not going to help. But having said that, it's not to say that there's not some distinction drawn between the two and guidance is given that if you're not dealing with communications data, that the, the um, evaluation of the country's laws and surveillance laws is a different evaluation. I don't know. Logically, I don't think the sector matters, but um, to try and make this more workable, um, there may be some guidance that is sector based. But we, again, unfortunately, I think it's a case of watch this space. Yeah, thank you, Joanne. And, and like you say, I think in terms of the, the amount of transferring and obviously the world that we live in, the globalised world, that, that obviously from all parties, both both sides of the Atlantic and political and, and legal kind of um, parties, there is obviously kind of a, an interest to get a solution to this and have a solution. Um, and I mean, from from my perspective it's probably now whilst waiting for kind of the watch this space and waiting for the updates it's probably more important than, than ever to make sure you've got that data mapping and know where the data is going and uh, you know where you need to update uh, uh, everything and obviously that's kind of steps people could could be taking in the interim whilst they're waiting to what to put in place um we are 29 minutes past so i think we're probably don't have any any time for any further um, questions. Um, so if we haven't, apologies if we haven't managed to get round to your questions as part of this Q and A, and that we'll be going through. Hopefully, I know some of the questions uh, came up that Joanne um, helpfully had already kind of uh, been pointed out or had had then worked through while she was discussing. Um, but if we haven't managed to get to one of your questions, then we will try and um, uh, feed back to you after this webinar. Um, Joanna, shall I just pass over to you for your final remarks? Um, yeah, that's great, Lauren. Um, I think, as has been said in the Q&A um, box, it is being recorded and it will be circulated 
um, to people that have registered. Um, thank you very much um, for coming. Um, if you do have any um, questions, um, if you can sort of let us know who you are, we can come back to you because um, with anonymous questions we can't. Um, then we appreciate it's quite a complex topic and a bit of a hot topic. So more than happy um, if you've got a question, if you come, if you let us know who you are. Um, and as I say, thank you very much um, for attending. Um, I suspect we might um, do an update once we've got a better idea um, of what the um, data protection authorities are saying. Um, and I'll say again what I've said throughout this. Unfortunately, watch this space. Um, I think European Data Protection Board, ICO, um, Irish DPC, I think they'll be hopefully giving us some guidance very quickly and um, practical decisions can then be taken by businesses as to where they go from there. But thank you very much for, for joining us.